All right. So, as I was contemplating the things we'll be reading this week and in our new um, series on fasting and feasting, it was interesting uh, talking with a number of uh, friends and colleagues and, and members of our congregation about their thoughts about fasting. And, and <laughs> interestingly enough, uh, one of the one of the things that came to mind is, is in the way of which we talk about fasting right now is, is very similar to my experience with how we give directions right now. Now I'm speaking specifically in terms of um, when we're trying to get somewhere, right? Uh, so going from place A to place B for direction. So I, I find that there's a bit of a, div- a divide, an age divide. Uh, if you're over a certain age, when I ask you for directions, you will give me uh, streets, you will give me cardinal directions and landmarks, you know, for example, to go north on Jungerman, to turn right at the Catholic Church, and then to uh, head south from there, and then four or five doors down, you'll be where you need to go. And, and, and I'm going to be real honest here. Thank you for caring enough to take the time to give me very detailed directions, but it's not helpful for me. (laughs) I'm not going to remember that. Uh, What I need from you is I need an address so I can plug it into Google Maps and so my phone can then give me the directions because I'm not going to know the landmarks that you know. Uh, I'm not honestly that great with cardinal directions when I'm in my car, so if you tell me north, I really have no idea if that means a left turn or a right turn most of the time, Uh, and and even if you say three doors down, I might not remember that you said three doors down, so it's much more helpful for me to get an address that I can plug in so I can see exactly where I'm going, so then I can get turn-by-turn directions um, and not have to necessarily remember anything. And I say this, so how does this relate to fasting? Well, often in, in the culture of the church, I find that uh, the way in which we have talked about fasting relies a lot on uh, uh, previous knowledge, per se. Uh, knowing a lot of things in order to truly appreciate what we're doing for fasting. For example, and during Lent, uh, it is often a tradition to give something up for Lent. Uh, and one popular way that we see that is on Fish Friday, something very popular here in St. Louis. We love our Fish Fry Fridays uh, because a uh, tradition within the Catholic Church is not to eat meat on, on Friday. However, why are we doing that? There's so much previous knowledge that we need to know about the traditions, about what's going on in order to truly and appreciate the fast and to do it as it was meant to be done. And so my hope for us today, my hope and my desire as we go through this series, um, talking about fasting and then getting into feasting, is that I can help give you an address to plug in in the Word of God so that you can get turn-by-turn instructions when we talk about fasting. So, so if you don't have a knowledge of the landmarks, you don't have a knowledge of the traditions or of the history of fasting within the church, that instead... Um, you can, you can know how to do it without uh, uh, perhaps forgetting yourself because we don't know how to fast. So often um, the definition that I've been given over the past month and even over the past year or so uh, <laughs> honestly has been wrong. <laughs> we just don't know. We, we, we have lost a lot of the knowledge of what it means to fast and fast in a way that is pleasing to God. So this is not uncommon. This is not something that is has not happened before. We're going to be in Isaiah today. And the prophet Isaiah, as he was uh, in his ministry in the midst, uh, the people of Judah had not been exiled yet, but he foresaw that they would be. They would not turn from their sins. So we saw that they're going to get exiled. They're going to get kicked out of the promised land as God promised them all the way back at the beginning of the foundation of their nation. And so he looked forward and he said, these exiles, these people who are not in their homeland anymore, are going to need to know to learn how to fast properly because the way that their ancestors are doing it is not the right way. God is displeased with how fasting is happening right now in, within his people in the nation of Judah and in the nation of Israel back when they were still a nation. And so he gives directions here, thankful for us. Th- through Isaiah, God gave us instructions on how to fast. He gives it to us in his word. We don't have to be uh, un- uncertain and, and, and guess exactly what he wants us to do. He tells us exactly what he wants us to do in a fast. And so to that effort, to that means, let us dig in, let us turn to it, and let us learn about this and very important practice uh, of the church, something, a gift that God has given us. And before we do that, let's pray before we dig into scripture. Dear Lord, we pray that you would uh, open up these words, that you would make their meaning known to us, that uh, we 
You would give us your Holy Spirit so that we would be edified by it. Our hearts and our minds and our souls would be changed by our encounter with you and by your actions and by your directions. Um, And Lord, I ask that as we do this, as we do this study, that you would be glorified. That uh, if I say something wrong, that you would correct it and correct it swiftly. Um, And that we would do this in a manner that would turn people towards you. Father, we pray this in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. So, let's read. Isaiah chapter 58. We're going to be starting in verse 1, going through the entire chapter. I invite you to read with me so she can come back and visit it and bookmark and say, Ah, yes, I want to know how to fast. This is the chapter that I can turn to first. Let's do. Cry aloud. Do not hold back. Lift up your voice like a trumpet. Declare to my people their transgression, to the house of Jacob their sins. This isn't the instructions. This is him telling Isaiah to do this, by the way. Verse 2, yet they seek me daily and delight to know my ways. That seems like a good thing. As if they were a nation that did righteousness and did not forsake the judgment of their God. Oh, no, that's a bad thing. They ask of me righteous judgments. They delight to draw near to God. Now, let's start there for a second. It seems like good things here happen. God's people, the house of Jacob, they seek God daily. They delight to know in his ways, good things. They ask of him righteous judgments, good things. And they delight to draw near to God. That should be great. But God's chastising them here. He's saying they do these things as if they were a nation that did righteousness and did not forsake the judgment of their God. Ah, we get a clue here. Things are not as they should be. There is a facade of, we are doing everything right. We're following the directions that you gave us. And God's saying, yeah, there's more to it than that. There's more to it than simply simply going through the motions. Let's read on. Let's continue. What is he talking about here? Verse 3. Why have we fasted? This is the people talking to God. Why have we fasted and you see it not? Why have we humbled ourselves and you take no knowledge of it? Come on, God, we're doing all the right things. Behold, in the day of your fast, you seek your own pleasure and oppress all your workers. Interesting. As they fast, they make the people underneath them work harder to make up for what they're doing. Huh. Behold, you fast only to quarrel and to fight and to hit with a wicked fist. Fasting like yours this day will not make your voice to be heard on high. Is such a fast, the fast that I choose, a day for a person to humble himself? I mean, that does seem like what a fast would be, right? Uh, Fasting is meant for humbling yourself, right? It's a time to do that huh but he's that that seems like a rhetorical question that has the answer no to it uh is it to bow down his head like a reed and to spread sackcloth and ashes ashes under him again that seems like what a fast should be or at least that's what we often hear the definition of fasting or at least it seems like that's what we hear as fasting is from the church but but god again seems to be asking a rhetorical question to which the answer is no will you call this a fast in a day acceptable to the lord He clearly seems to be that we should be answering no. But at least from what we know of fasting, or at least what the tradition is of fasting, give up something for Lent, to to deny yourself something, um, to humble yourself before God. That that seems like what a fast is, at least how we define it as a church right now. And God seems to be saying that, "Mm, no, that's not it. All right, so let's dig in. Verse 3. God apparently does not see nor acknowledge this type of fast. So, Fasting, from what he's saying here, is not a day for a person to humble himself, to spread sackcloth and then ashes underneath him. Odd. So what, what, what is his critique here? Well, his critique is that their fast, the fasting in this way, is selfish. He says it right there in, in verses 3 and 4. He says, your fast is a day where you seek your own pleasure. Ah, yes, you're giving up meat on Friday, but then you go and celebrate in a fish fry. (laughs) Interesting. Ah, yes, maybe you're giving up chocolate for Lent, but then you're finding another sweet to to satisfy the desire uh, that you have for chocolate. But you're not eating chocolate, right? Okay, interesting. Um, And then verse 5, he asks these questions. 
that are clearly showing that, that fasting, hmm, fasting is not about us. His problem that he has with the fast of the people of God here is that, okay, they're fasting, but they're seeking their own pleasure. Not only that, not only are they seeking their own pleasure in their fasting, but then they're also oppressing the workers around them. Everybody's life around the person is becoming more miserable when that person fasts. They become quarrelsome. They stir up strife. They get hangry. This is not the fast that God has chosen. But this seems to be the fast that we preach in the church, right? God is saying here, this is our first main point, is that fasting is not for our benefits. Fasting is not for me. When I fast, I'm not the one who's meant to be primarily benefiting. Because there are a lot of fasts, a lot of, apparently, especially recently, more and more fasts that are instituted for our own personal benefit. One of those is the uh, uh, recent trend of intermittent fasting. Perhaps you've heard of it. It's something that has it, it, been roundly, roundly applauded and found to be beneficial for the person in terms of personal health and athletic benefit. It does a, intermittent fasting goes a long ways in teaching your body to use your fat for fuel instead of relying on carbs, which is a good thing, because as Americans, we typically have a lot more fat in our bodies than we need to have. But again, this type of fasting, intermittent fasting, it's specifically for our benefit. And God is saying, fasting here is not for our benefit. Fasting as he chooses, as he desires. that's not to say that intermittent fasting is bad by any means, no. But the fasting that he is calling us to is not for us primarily, not for me primarily. And what is this general? Let's talk, let's be frank here, let's be up front. When we talk about fasting in the church, so often I grew up with this understanding. In fact, I very much had this type of understanding until I started studying this for myself here, is that what is a fast? A fast means to abstain from food, abstain from drink, perhaps maybe you can drink water, but, but don't eat for a certain period of time. Perhaps it's a day, perhaps it's several days, perhaps it's a certain meal um, at a certain time to schedule this out. And then what? Right? If, if you're abstaining from that food, if you're abstaining from drink, you're abstaining from that, then somehow that's supposed to bring us closer to God. By making us suffer, by making ourselves suffer, then we, I don't know, I've heard a lot of reasons, then we understand more the suffering that Jesus went through on our behalf. We have a greater appreciation for what he did. Um, but let's be real honest about what's happening when we do that. When we're simply fasting by abstaining from food, we are rejecting the gifts of God and saying, I think that having this gift makes me a worse person. And so by not having this gift, I will become a better person. God isn't getting glorified by doing that. The only thing that's getting glorified is our willpower. Because we're con- in the end saying, wow, great for us that we did this, that we were able to not have food for a while and somehow mystically, spiritually, that brought us closer to God because we didn't eat a meal. No. No, by no means. So what is, are we supposed to do but for fasting? Well, let's read on. Here we go. Let's dig in. Verse 6. Is not this the fast that I choose? To loose the bonds of wickedness to undo the straps of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free, and to break every yoke. Huh, he's not talking anything about food here. Is it not to share your bread with the hungry? Oh, now he's talking about food, but he's talking about giving food to people, not abstaining from food ourselves that's interesting and bring the homeless poor into your house when you see the naked to cover him and not to hide yourself from your own flesh then shall your light break forth like the dawn and your healing shall spring up speedily your righteousness shall go before you the glory of the lord shall be your rear guard can you oh just i mean just think about that for a second The glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. If anything tries to come and attack you from behind, the glory of God himself is protecting you. That's impressive. Then you shall call and the Lord shall answer. You shall cry and he will say, here I am. If you take away the yoke from your midst, a yoke is a symbol of oppression, the symbol of servitude, of slavery. 
the pointing of the finger and speaking of wickedness. Do away with these things. If you pour yourself out for the hungry, or maybe an even fuller translation, if you pour your soul out for the hungry and satisfy the desire of the afflicted, then shall your light rise in the darkness and your gloom be as the noonday. And the Lord will guide you continually and satisfy your desire in scorched places and make your bones strong. And you shall be like a watered garden, like a spring of water whose waters do not fail. And your ancient roots shall be rebuilt and you shall raise up the foundations of many generations. You shall be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of streets to dwell in. Verses 6 and 7 right there. Our fast should result in the life of the people around us getting better. When we fast, those around us who are experiencing oppression, those around us who are hungry, those around us who don't have a home, who don't have shelter, those around us who don't have clothing will be fed, will be freed, will be housed, will be clothed. And then again, as he repeats in verses 9b and 10a, If you take away the yoke from your midst, if you take away, if you actively work to break oppression, specifically oppression, that's such a hot button word for us today that that it can be so easy for us to shy away and and label it social justice warrior and, and have nothing to do with it. But no, God himself right here is saying, if you take away oppression from your midst, if you stop pointing fingers at other people and speaking wickedness, Then, then all of these promises that God has and has promised here will come to pass. Come to pass. So what is our fasting supposed to be like? Our fasting breaks injustice, oppression, and poverty. So let's talk, how does it do that? What, what can we glean from here now? So, so if fasting isn't merely humbling ourselves, denying ourselves food so that we somehow become more holy, then, then, then what are we doing? Oftentimes when I'm working, uh, perhaps I'm doing a, a project at home or um, <laughs> oftentimes it has to do with a math problem or, or maybe I'm here at work and I'm, I'm working through a scripture or something that I'm invested in, it's interesting, it's important, and it needs to get done, right? I will forget to eat. <laughs> My wife can tell you this. I will forget to eat unless she physically reminds me to eat because I'm so engrossed in what's happening because I know the importance because I desire it so greatly. I love what I'm doing and so much so that I won't even think about my body being hungry, won't even recognize that my stomach is telling me it's time to eat because I know what's happening is such a good thing. Now, I don't mean to glorify myself by any means. In many ways, that's a problematic behavior. But when we take this, it it very much applies in terms of fasting. What God is telling us, what he's showing us here, right? Because fasting is that when we are seeing something that is good to be done, when we are seeing something that deserves to be acted upon, when we are desiring the good things of God so much so and seeing an application for them that we would forget to eat because we want to pursue them, that, that is fasting. So often in the Bible, fasting is a response a response to something that has happened. We were just in the book of Esther. There came out an edict for the genocide of all of the Jews and in response to that, everyone was so grieved. All the Jewish people were so grieved that they stopped eating or drinking for three days to call upon the Lord because they, their desire for God to deliver them and to intercede was far greater than their desire to eat. This is fasting. And now, here, here, here's uh, uh, 
another thing that I'd like to add in here. Fasting, God does not define fasting as having to be an abstention from food. No, what he does say is that when you fast, his critique of fasting is that when you're fasting, you're seeking your own pleasure while you're doing this. So, by inference, we're saying that fasting is not seeking our own personal pleasure. It's turning away from the things that give us our own personal pleasure and towards the things that benefit the people around us and the people of God. So, let's talk practically. What does this look like? What are the things that distract you from doing what God is calling you to do? What are those things when you're like, you know what, I should read my Bible. I should pray. I should go out on Monday morning and help out at that mobile food bank because it's a good thing to go and feed homeless and hungry people. Or I should be a part of that prayer group that's praying for God to intercede on behalf of our city and our nation. Or, I mean, we can go on and on about the things that we should be doing, that God calls us to be doing. But what I'm wanting you to focus on is what are the things that get us distracted? Let's go through a list of the things that get me distracted, right? A good show on Netflix. Oh man, it's so much easier though to just sit in my couch and to watch and binge watch something for an entire day. Or I'm thinking about where I want to go out to eat. I'd much rather sit down and have a nice big meal than, than worry about anything else that's going on on me. Or video games for me too. Something that distracts me. Some type of entertainment. So often... In America especially, it's the entertainment that distracts our focus, right? Because it's just so much easier to open up your phone and scroll through Instagram or TikTok or Facebook or social media or read some type of news or to get angry (laughs) about the latest horrible thing that somebody said or did instead of putting down the things distracting us and actually working to love the people around us. In short, when something grips your heart, when you hear about something happening that is so grievous, so awful, or something that needs to be changed, what do you turn to to numb yourself instead of interceding to God? What's your chosen medication so that you don't have to feel the pain of a world that is so messed up? Is it food? So often it can be food. That's typically why fasting uh, uh, calls for an abstention from food because, I mean, as Americans, right, we focus on food like no other nation. There's one way to tell if, it's, if somebody is an American, if, if you're in a different country and speaking English, it's because they'll talk about food in that conversation. <laughs> we have such a focus on food, we are rarely not talking about food. We even eat food when we're driving, when we're walking, we take food to go. That's why so often fasting focuses on food because we become so obsessed with food. It's, so ne- it's such a, a basic necessity of life that it's so easy for us to abuse the gift of God while neglecting the things that we should be doing. But there are so many other things than just food that we can abuse. So many other things that are gifts from God that we can use and abuse instead of doing the things that God calls us to do because we're seeking our own pleasure instead of breaking the yoke of oppression. Richard Foster has a quote that fasting reveals the things that control us. John Piper goes on to say he has an entire book on fasting back on, he wrote in like 1997. And, and honestly, if you just, if you read just the introduction in that book, it's a fantastic start, place to start. It, it, it's really well written. Um, but so often he, he, he shows us, what fasting does is it shows us how we have taken God's gifts And we start to desire the gifts of God more than we desire God. More than we desire the good things that God calls us to do. 
And so when we are fasting, the fast that God calls us to is that when we see something that's not right in the world, instead of moving on to the next thing that will distract our minds, that will get our minds off of it, let us turn and address it. And so many, and so often what we can do is prayer, right? You watch a documentary. There's so many good documentaries about the things that are, that are not going well in America. And when you get done with that documentary, it's like, wow, that, that really affected me, for example. That really affected me. All right, what are we going to go eat? Or you open up your phone. Oh, what else? What other thing can I watch? What other person can I text? What other things are interesting on Instagram or TikTok? Or what's the next movie or next show that I would like to watch? Anything to get your mind off of the uncomfortable reality that you just heard about. Or <laughs> another thing, another guilty pleasure to engage in ranting about it on social media without actually going and physically doing anything about it. God's saying that, and as we see so often in the Bible, that a fast is a response to something that is wrong. Fasting is not for our benefit. Fasting is not a practice, so often I hear it called a spiritual discipline uh, I think that's unhelpful terminology. Um, Because it should be a natural reaction for us, not something that we are disciplining ourselves to schedule out and to do and, and, and making us feel guilty if we don't know. It should be, wow, that hurt. I am sad. I am grieved by this. I am going to do something about it because God is calling me to do that. That is the mission that God has for his people to shine light into the darkness. One of the things, one of the hard things about fasting, one of the hard things about abstaining from the things that give us pleasure for the sake of doing something that God calls us to is that the things that God calls us to are hard. They're draining. They take energy from us. Right? You get done with that and, you're, and, it's, and you know probably at the end of it you'll, you'll feel better, right? But it's like, man, it's just so much easier. <laughs> it's so much easier to just open my phone. It's so much easier to just watch a movie. I don't have the energy to do what God's calling us. And what he says in this passage, if you pour yourself out for the hungry and satisfy the desires of the afflicted, then God, the Lord, will guide you continually and satisfy your desire in scorched places. Make your bones strong and you shall be like a watered garden. God is promising, I will sustain you. I will give you what you need in order to fast in the way that I am calling you to do. And then he goes on in verses 13 and 14 and he gives us an example of exactly what a fast might look like, an easy one to implement, one that the Israelites do and the people of God in Judah uh, apparently weren't very good at either. Verse 13, if you turn your foot from the Sabbath, from doing your pleasure on my holy day and calling this, and call the Sabbath a delight and the holy day of the Lord honorable, if you honor it, not going your own ways or seeking your own pleasure or talking idly, Then you shall take delight in the Lord, and I will make you ride on the heights of the earth. I will feed you with the heritage of Jacob your father, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Man, what if I were to tell you that God has set aside one day for you not to work, for you not to go through the drudgery of work, but instead to spend it resting, to take a break from the stresses and the anxieties and the cares of the world, and to rest on that day. Sounds like a great day, right? Man, that's exactly what the Sabbath is. God was telling these people of Judah, he's like, you implement all your own fast. You try to discipline yourself to, to have a regular fast at self-appointed times, times when I didn't appoint them, but then when the Sabbath comes around, you don't even keep the fast that I told you to keep. Because I know this fast, God, as he says, as Jesus says in the New Testament, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. God instituted this day of rest on the seventh day for our own good. And so if you're looking for a place, where do I start fasting? What would be, maybe try once a month to take a Sabbath
take a Sabbath, and instead of seeking our own pleasure, instead of uh, turning to the things that, that um, we typically would spend a lot of our time on, and that we can all rightfully acknowledge would be wasting our own time, to seek the good things of God. And see if the promises that God makes in this passage come true. Because God's done such a great work for us already, right? God's saying, turn from these things. I have called you to do these good things, but I have already empowered you to do them. And we know that. Why? We know that because of what he already did with Jesus on the cross. He saved us from death. He saved us from sin. He's raised Jesus to life by his power. How much greater is his power going to be in us? If he can raise Jesus, if he can raise himself from the dead, he can sustain us through a lack of energy or through not being able to or not having the downtime to watch a TV show for, I think, what is the average American watch TV for right now? Four to five hours a day. And as a testament to that, right, as a testament that God... (laughs) God will sustain us through this time, through this fasting, even though it's going to be hard, even though it's something that we don't naturally want to choose on our own. But when we see the hard things of the world, when we see the things that need to change in the world, and we turn away from that which would contribute to our own pleasure and instead turn towards those hard things and seek to do the work of God, he testifies that he will sustain us. And a reminder of that, right? is the way in which he calls us to feast. Now, we'll get into feasting more later, right? And and a little preview uh, for in several weeks when we turn into feasting. If we think fasting is hard, feasting seems like it would be the easiest thing for us, but man, do we, are we really bad at feasting? (laughs) We'll go more into that, but uh, let us for now, let us for now feast at the table of God. Let us enjoy the, the, the good things, the sustenance, the sustaining that he gives us, the nourishment that he gives us because he says that he will sustain us throughout our times, throughout the times that we choose to do what he has desired for us to do. So, ah, let us eat, let us drink, let us come to the table and to feast as he has called us to feast. And so that in those times when we are fasting, we are full. All right, on the night that he was betrayed, Jesus took the bread And after giving thanks, he broke it, saying, this is my body, broken for you. Take and eat in remembrance of me. In the same manner, after they had supped, he took the cup and he poured it out, saying, this is my body, this is my blood, poured out on your behalf as a New Testament. As often as you do this, do this in remembrance of me of me. Ah, interesting. As often as you do, as often as you eat, as often as you drink, do so in the way that I have called you to do. Do it in remembrance of me feeding hungry people. So let us, for we are hungry, we need nourishment, come to the table to eat and to drink. And just as we eat this bread, just as we drink this wine, and as our bodies are nourished, so the Holy Spirit nourishes us with the living bread and water that only Jesus Christ can give table is ready. I invite you to join us.